It's time now for the award-winning number one local talk show in Northeast Pennsylvania, The Sam LaSant Show. Now here's your host, Sam LaSant. All right, so folks, you get up in the morning, you know, you have to go to work, you have all these concerns. Uh, I'm sure every time you get up in the morning, you sit down and say, now, what's happening in the state of Pennsylvania? Let me uh, digest all of the budgets, and, and I'm very concerned about what's happening in the state of Pennsylvania. Well, folks, I don't think you do that. But you do want people to be concerned about what's happening in the state of Pennsylvania as far as the budget's concerned and where your money is going. Hi, everyone. I'm Sam Lasan. Thanks for joining us. My guest today from the 14th Sen Pennsylvania Senatorial uh, District, uh, Senator John Udichak. No stranger to the Sam Lasan Show. Senator, thanks for coming on the show. Sam, thank you as always. I got to tell you, uh, it's always it's it's always a pleasure to um, to have the politicians come on after they you know you you've campaigned and uh, accountability and uh, uh, you've always been there, John, and I appreciate that very much. Okay, however, um, I need to ask you a question. Yes. First of all, how's the family? Family's great. The girls are doing fantastic, especially our Hello. new addition, Grace, uh, who's. Uh, Five months, uh, going on six months, says uh, she's an absolute doll baby. How many children do you have? Four girls. Four girls. Uh, I'm a little upset with you, too, mm -hmm. because I've been going to, you know, the, my, our, our pizza place, right. and I sometimes, you know, when I'd see you there, you'd buy me a pizza. Right. But you haven't, have you been going there? But, uh, Grace isn't on solid foods yet, so as soon as uh, we can get, <laughs> get her on, on solid foods, uh, we'll, we'll be back to grab four pizza. Gr four girls. Four girls. They're like Barletta, all the girls, no guys. And the baby, or both our baby uh, names are Grace. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, it's, 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 it's good. I'm glad to see everything's doing fine. Thank you. The state of Pennsylvania, uh, with the budget, uh, you know, <clears throat> as I said, we, when people get up in the morning, you know, their, their concern is not what's happening with you know the state what's the budget their concern is going to work try to pay their bills they have enough on their plates so we depend on people like you who we put into office to hopefully do the right thing okay um, any f household that um, it has a certain income coming in uh, assuming you have a household that has sixty thousand dollars a year coming in with both people working and um, you're used to you know maybe getting a new car going to dinner uh, doing certain things and then all of a sudden one person loses their job and let's say there's twenty thousand dollars that comes out of that household now they're forty thousand dollars that they're left with well now what happens is they have to say well you know what look we can't go to dinner as much as we can we can't buy a new car we have to cut back all right I think the state of Pennsylvania faces the same kind of situation with the budget all right with that being said um, uh, what is your stand uh, on, on the budget in general. Then I have specific questions I'd like to ask you. Well, the, the last two years under the current administration have been very difficult, and I think more difficult than they need to be. Uh, your analogy to a family household is, is, is a good example. Uh, there's no question that because of the Great Recession that has that is, uh, uh, hit uh, Pennsylvania and, and the nation, and that we're still struggling. Too many people, uh, too many families out of work, over half a million Pennsylvanians unemployed and and more than that the chronic unemployed those that have been long term uh, in terms of a year two years without a job without going to work every day and put food on on, on the table for the family uh, we haven't addressed that we understand that you got to tighten your belt and there's no question there are things uh, in state government that you can trim the fat and get out uh, the waste fraud uh, abuse in those things that you cannot spend on. But just like a household, say for example, give you the best example I can give you, what I think the mistake that the current administration is making. When you have a home uh, a mortgage, now if you can go in and your mortgage rate is 16 percent and right now they're at about four, if you don't go in and remortgage that house and save that, save those dollars so you can reinvest, get your kids an education, reinvest in that roof that you need, we're not doing that in Pennsylvania over these last two budgets. It's been driven by ideology. It's being driven really by uh, these national think tanks, the, the conservative, far-right think tanks, really out of the mainstream of Pennsylvania. Uh, and, and so there's a disconnect. And going after, for example, education at uh, K through 12 level, going at education through uh, uh, colleges and universities. Let me give you an example. Uh, and I keep using this, and I used this at the Hazleton Chamber of Commerce Red uh, Carpet Breakfast the other day. 1985, Back to the Future was the most popular movie in the country. 1985, Pennsylvania spent about $260 million on corrections and about $2 billion on higher education. 
Today, they're reversed. We're spending $2 billion on corrections and $260 million on higher education. So in terms of that family, that family that's got to tighten the budget, get rid of the unnecessary expenses, and we need to do that. I, we've, we've cut funding in the last two years of the Rendell budget, and quite frankly, we just moved the bill out of the Senate, uh, which restored about a half a billion dollars to the governor's original proposal. I support it. one of a handful of, of Democrats that support it. Still major cuts across the board in every agency and every department. But there's an opportunity with new revenue and finding those new funding streams, not raising taxes. This is a budget that doesn't raise taxes that we passed out of the Senate. And I hope it, it goes through the House and gets to the governor's desk and we can, we can put an end to the draconian cuts that I think really uh, are counterintuitive. You need to invest. Every business owner, you know as a business owner, if you're not making an investment in the future, your business isn't going to be there in the future. And that's what I'm concerned about with the last two budgets. The last two budgets were more about ideology, of sending a message that we're going to be tough and we're going to cut. And, and I don't think it got to the number one priority that we should be focused on. Let's get those half a million people back to work. Let's have a productive, growing economy. And the way you need to do that if you're going to win the jobs race, you've got to win the education race. Last two years, we've taken more than $2 billion out of our education strategy, higher education, K through 12. I think that's a mistake. Well, Secretary Muser was on my show and discussed the budget. Uh, and according to what the budget I saw was, well, you have to take the stimulus money and get rid of it because the stimulus money came in. This year, there's more money in the education budget than there ever was in the education budget. Now, that's one thing. Number two, and I'm just presenting facts. Number two, there's always the accountability factor. If you keep on putting money into anything, it's like having a bad business. If you keep on putting money into a bad business and you're still getting the same results, then there's something wrong. Okay, so I don't know where there is, number one, the accountability factor for what our educational system is. I know I have the PSEA president here, nice guy, and let me tell you, our teachers in Hazleton, this is not politics, second to none, but then we have to have accountability, okay? And so if there's more money going into the education budget, all right, and, and, and I don't know about ideology, but the point is that when Governor uh, Corbett ran, he ran on a platform. And he said, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this. When John Udichek ran, he said, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this. So I'm thinking, well, I like those ideas, so I'm going to vote for Governor Corbett. I'm going to vote for, for John Udichek. Now I'm expecting you to do what I voted you, you to do, okay? So those were the th kind of cuts that we, we begin to... Where is, where is the accountability factor? Well, let's... A few things. Yeah. One... And I've heard this uh, uh, time and time again, and I heard it from the governor's budget secretary. Uh, I've heard it from uh, his revenue secretary, Dan Mew, who's a good friend who's doing an exceptional job. Right. was a tremendous help to me, by the way, in, in helping our, our, our flood-impacted businesses uh, last year. But this idea that the governor set it on the campaign trail, therefore don't be surprised that that's the kind of budget yet. I would ask you and your research staff to go and find where the governor said on the campaign trail, <clears throat> I'm going to do away with adult basic and throw 45,000 people off of the health care rolls. I'm going to do away with $2 billion out of the education budget. The governor's central theme in his campaign, because he signed a no tax pledge with a Washington uh, think tank, was I'm not going to raise taxes. And that's fine. I, I think that was a mistake for a governor, someone who's going to be the general executive of, of a state uh, uh, to, to sign a one-sentence pledge that's going to hamstring your ability to govern and your ability to be an executive of a billion-dollar operation. So the governor, his central part was he's not going to raise taxes. Well, the budgets that we're talking about, whether it's the Senate uh, Republican budget, even though as a Democrat I supported that, that Senate Republican budget, or, or the Democratic ideas that we've advanced for the budget, still don't raise taxes. We're not talking about raising taxes. We're talking about getting smart about revenue. And we're certainly not talking about giving away revenue, which I think we're doing under this administration, giving away revenue to, to out-of-state mega corporations at the expense of our Broad Street and Main Street businesses. 
John, you, I want, I want, and I'm glad you brought that up. I'm, I'm going to come back on that. Uh, folks, I'm talking to Senator John Udichak, always willing to be here, always willing to uh, uh, answer the questions. Why are we the worst state in the entire 50 states for business attraction? Uh, and there's always this thing we call cause and effect. Uh, and um, are tax breaks good? What about Marcella Shale? Are we really going after them? We shouldn't be going after them. Uh, gas prices are as low as ever they, and what about regulations? You know what regulations are, folks. They regulate you to death, and they discourage you from doing things. A lot more to talk to the Senator when we come back. Thanks for staying with us, folks. I'm Sam LaSant. Folks, welcome to our no, new viewers in Schuylkill County. Remember, 24-7 SSPTV.com, all of our shows, and uh, we're having great success with our 4 o'clock news posts. As you know, we combine with KYW at 5 o'clock and back at 6 o'clock with local news. Thanks for making us number one uh, with uh, over now, folks. Get it? 87 to 90,000 people are watching Local News 13 every weekday, according to the latest notarized surveys. We're blowing everybody out of the water. Thank you so much. I appreciate that so much. My guest, Senator John Yadichak, here to tell us about the budget. You had, I, I mentioned before the break, we became the, the, the worst state in, in 50 states for business. Something's wrong here, John. Somebody's doing something wrong. I mean, you, now, you, you're talking about cutting taxes, you know, closing the Delaware loophole uh, and the creation of jobs, and it, they all sound good things, okay? But what happened? Mm -hmm. Well, we haven't closed the Delaware loophole. Uh, that has not been done. That's where I think, you know... Explain the, to the, uh, the viewers what that is. When, when a company comes to Pennsylvania and they'll s set up a shell company in Delaware because of their uh, corporate tax structure, and all they'll literally have is a, is a P.O. box. Mm -hmm. uh, and as a result of that, they, they escape the corporate net income tax. Uh, many small businesses in Pennsylvania are set up differently under our tax laws, and they, are, they pay a rate uh, at the personal income tax rate, 3.07. Uh, now... I think, and we're, we're phasing out, and I've supported this, the phase out of the capital stock and franchise tax. We're continuing uh, that. Uh, and uh, we have proposed we can lower the corporate net income tax. There's no question of that. But we've got to close the loopholes. I think there's too many of the special interest tax breaks that evolved over the years, and I'm not assigning blame. Well, well, let me ask you a question. To be the devil's advocate with you. If I, have, if I set up a, a corporation in Delaware, mm -hmm. but I'm operating in Pennsylvania, so let's say I set up SSP TV in Delaware because I want to take advantage of their loopholes or whatever. But in Pennsylvania, I have a, a SSP TV which is employing 500 people. Right. Okay. So now, would the fear be that, well, wait a minute, if you're going to close that, well, then why should I then be in Pennsylvania? You know, I can move my, take my 500 jobs out of there and move them to something. Is, there, is, there, is that a fear that we, you may have? No, because most economic developments will, will tell you that the, the tax rates generally aren't what drive the investment. I mean, they're going to look, you know, real estate's about location. They look at the education attainment level, what, what's the workforce. And I think that's a component that we're missing, that, you know, we need a highly trained, skilled workforce. Every tour, and I try to take one tour every month uh, that I've been in office to go see a new facility, a manufacturing plant, uh, uh, retail, and, and understand from that CEO's perspective, from the person on the line to the CEO, what makes your business work? How can government make it work? Is it regulation? Can we take off? Uh, can we regulate in a smarter way to make your business grow? W the tax rates. What is it? It comes back time and time again. I need a highly skilled, trained workforce. If I have that, I can grow. Uh, and, and there are places that I've been to, even in this a tough economy, if you can believe it, they say, you know, we have 20 positions that we could fill today, but I don't have the people for them. So uh, it, it's a combination. Yes, the tax rate. Yes, the, the so infrastructure. So you, you don't think that once you do begin to close those loopholes that it will affect any no. kind of jobs? In I think if you combine them with serious corporate tax reform, we're phasing out the capital stock and franchise tax, we can lower the corporate net income tax, you close the loophole, you level the playing field. You know, even something, as a t and, and, and Secretary Muser may have talked about it, he's do, doing a good job of trying to, trying to close this loophole. You know, we have a situation where we have a tax law on the books that people aren't paying, the online sales tax, so that the Main Street business has to pay the tax, and that may impact their businesses. But some mega 
uh, online uh, uh, company. It's not a new tax. It's a tax on, on the books where, they, where they're, they're avoiding paying that tax, the, the consumer on that online site. So we're losing anywhere from 100 to, to $200 million a year just on that. That's revenue loss. That means programs that shouldn't be cut are getting cut because we're not enforcing the laws that we have on the books because we have these special interest loopholes in the law for corporations that generally favor the big out-of-state companies versus our small mom-and-pop operations here in Pennsylvania. And you're saying that special interest is costing us $2 billion a year? I, I think uh, special interest loophole, when you talk about, and, I, and I'll run down the list, this is one thing the governor did as soon as he was in office, unilaterally without the General Assembly, the, the federal bonus depreciation. Uh, uh, they changed that. That's costing us probably about $400 million. The uh, Delaware loopholes, about $500 uh, uh, million dollars that we're losing. The, uh, the uh, online tax is probably another uh, $200 million. So you start adding them up. Uh, you know, I think we're in the neighborhood of a billion uh, and a half uh, in, in where we're losing that revenue. Uh, it's revenue uh, that not only lost to our budget, but that's a disadvantage to Pennsylvania Main Street businesses. And, and we need to stand on the side of those that have invested in Pennsylvania, that have invested in Hazleton, in Greater Hazleton. We need to fight for those businesses. All right, now, looking at the budget and looking at the condition that the state is in, all right, something has to be done to generate business. So you're beginning to address those issues, all right? Um, do you feel right now with the, the, with the current budget and the current cuts for small businesses, because I'm going to tell you, you guys are, ain't good to me in the state of Pennsylvania. Right. All you guys are doing is making my life miserable as a small businessman, okay, and continue to compound me re regulations that are ridiculous. We'll, ad we'll address that in a second. Um, but do you feel that you're, this particular budget and, and that will begin to stimulate what you need to stimulate? No, I think it leaves some very important components off. Again, I supported the Senate Republican ver version of the budget, which added a half a billion dollars to where the governor was at in his proposal back in February. Revenues are better. Projections are, are better. So we were able to put money back, $112 million into basic education, $245 million into our universities, uh, uh, about $84, $85 million in, in the cuts to human services and to our hospitals. Um, what Pennsylvania needs to do, and this is one thing that has not been a part of the budget, and, and it's a serious problem for the governor, it's our infrastructure investment. For two years now, we've left two construction seasons go by with no transportation plan on the table. The governor created a transportation commission that recommended, and the secretary uh, for... Uh, for transportation uh, for PennDOT, Barry Scott, tremendous guy, well respected uh, it, across the board, across the aisle, uh, in his profession and in politics. They put together a commission authorized by the governor saying we need $2.7 billion in infrastructure in Pennsylvania to create jobs, to, to set the stage for private sector growth. The logistics industry is very important in Greater Hazleton. We need to invest not only in our roads and bridges, in our water and sewer systems, in our energy uh, infrastructure, and in our technology infrastructure. That plan, the governor's commission that he authorized, is gathering dust on the shelf, not a part of either budget. Doesn't want to address that. Now, Why? Why do you think? I, I, I th because he, he signed a one-sentence pledge to a Washington, D.C. think tank, and because there might be uh, a revenue increase, whether it's fees on driver's license or whether it's uh, this or it's that, he has to step back and says, I, I can't violate my one sentence plan. But he's not stupid. The governor is not stupid. I mean, I, 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 th those are the kind of things that that confuse me. I mean, if, if you have people like you who do this every day, uh, who are respected, and you come in with, uh, and the commission comes in here, I don't, I don't understand why the governor would say, well, we're it, not going to do it. It's anymore. very frustrating. In the Senate Democrats, we've come up with, a, with an alternative proposal. Say, okay, you, we don't want to tackle the $2.7 billion uh, recommendations from the commission. And by the way, that was introduced as a, as, as a legislation by Senator Jake Corman, who's a, a friend and, and the chairman, the Republican chairman of the Appropriations Committee. He's introduced that, but there's been no action. 
Senate Democrats have said, listen, we can't lose another construction season. This construction season, we could put a billion dollars into the pipeline for, for roads and bridges. We can do that through what they call Garvey bonds. Garvey bonds, we take our federal funding. We leverage that federal funding. Virginia just did it. Virginia did it for about $1.5 billion. 35 other states have done it across the nation. Think of what we can do with that billion dollars. And the ratio is this, and it's, it's, it's impressive. For every dollar you invest in infrastructure, $4 comes back to the economy. That's a pretty good ratio. Pretty good, right. So that's the kind of investment. You want to get this economy going, you want to start helping uh, small businesses and, and attracting businesses to Pennsylvania, you need a world-class infrastructure, you need world-class education, you need a highly skilled and trained workforce, and you need a good tax environment. So all this information, okay, that you're talking about and putting together, okay, is it ever, how is it presented in, by a committee to the governor, or what's the process? Hold that thought. I'm talking to Senator John Udichak, folks. Uh, as you can see, there's a lot of things going on internally that we're not aware of. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm so appreciative that when uh, Representative Tuhill, Congressman Barletta, and Senator Udichak come on the show, at least to give us some insight. And I'm going to tell you one thing, not because he's sitting here, this guy does not lie. Uh, and he tells you the way it is. I may not agree with some of the things he says, but he's not a liar. He tells you exactly the way it is, and that's why I, I, I think he's doing a great job. Stay with us. Thanks for staying with us, folks. I'm Sam LaSant, SSPTV.com. My email, sam at SSPTV.com. Please uh, um, send your comments. My guest, Senator John Udichak, who is the, it's the 14th Senatorial District in the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, the senator has always been here, always been responsive, and always been upfront with it. Uh, we talk about regulations. There are some businesses in the greater Hazelton area and the Schuylkill County, Luzerne County, that when they begin to do things, we know we have to stay by the law, environmental, et cetera. But uh, sometimes, John, it's DEP, it's, it could become ridiculous, okay? Uh, what, what's being done with people who are overregulated? Well, I, I think, you know, I'm, I've been critical of the governor in a lot of respects. Uh, I, I do have to uh, give them uh, a pat on the back where I think the, the mindset of what I've heard from businesses quite often is, listen, there's seven regional offices for DP across the state. They have seven different rule books. There should be one rule book. Give us the set of rules. We'll work by them. I don't, or, or you know, God forbid, in, in one of the regional offices, one guy comes out to the site and he has a different rule book than the other guy that came out to the site. You need one set of rules, uniformity across the board of the Commonwealth, and that goes for PennDOT, that goes for all the state agencies. In what's frustrating, I've worked on many projects where uh, we'll have state investment, we'll, we'll have millions of dollars in state investment, and we'll have state agencies holding up that investment in terms of their regulation. Uh, so, you know, whether it's a highway occupancy permit, through PennDOT, whether it's a, a permit through DUP, where we, we were working on a, 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 on a facility up in uh, Monroe County, tremendous facility, going after uh, Fortune 50 companies to bring them in six, eight, nine months to get a permit, sometimes two years to get a permit. That's unacceptable. That's where we gotta, we gotta cut through the red tape. Uh, we, we obviously need smart regulation in terms, you know, like in the Marcella Shale play. Uh, you know, we, we have to make sure that we regulate that industry in a smart way, but you can't over-regulate to where it becomes a burden uh, to business, to where it suppresses job creation. That's where we got to get smart. We got to cut through that red tape. And I'll give uh, the governor and, 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 his, uh, and his team credit in that, that at least that mindset of saying we're going to have one rule book, we're going to have some uniformity. I think that's a, okay. that's a good idea. Now, I said before uh, the break, uh, one thing you've never done, at least uh, since knowing you as many years as I do, you, you never lie, okay? Now, it's easy to say all these things, John. It's mm -hmm. easy to say regulation, regulations. However, no, I don't know. I'm, I'm, some people tell me that it can, it's still continuing. Is anything being done about it? It, government is, is not a swift moving machine. It is a slow uh, 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 monolithic uh, operation. So that's, that's the frustrating part. Business is now moving at light speed. Uh, they, you, you don't have six months of lead time to get a building. They want a shovel ready site. And that's why we had a business in our sites program that, you know, get the site ready for the business that's coming. Uh, we need to do more of those kind of things. I think we're working together. We've, we've changed that. We've gone after some regulation. A lot more work needs to be done. And, 
you have to continue to be a good advocate as you are for small businesses and the seniors and the, and, and the people of Greater Hazleton. And uh, that gets our attention, I could be sure of that. So uh, all, all we'd like to see is some improvements being done. We, we realize it can't be done overnight, but uh, what, I'm, what I don't like is when, and good politicians make for good government, okay? I don't think it's a dirty word, but what happens is people have been so misled and then what happens is that, you know, they just give up. Right. You know, they're, they're all a bunch of bums. And, and I don't like that because there are a lot of great people in, in the Congress right now in the state that are really working sincerely hard. Right. And there are a couple of bums that we hope to get rid of. I always feel good people make good politicians. Yes, yes. And good people make good government. Exactly. When people feel that they have an ownership yeah. uh, and, they're, and, and they're a part of the decision making. So apathy, uh, giving up, uh, that's not an option for good government. That's when the guys, the bad actors, Come get in. to run the show. Senator, thanks for coming on the Thank show. Thank you. Always. Take care of those girls. Thank okay, I got, they got you like this. Folks, Senator John Yudichak, uh, always here to respond. We'd like to have him on a couple, every, every couple of months to uh, be accountable. Uh, SSPTV.com or Sam at SSPTV.com. Remember, go to our website 24-7. We now have an app. Uh, check us out on the app. We'll see you next time.